Well, good morning, church. Larry, thank you for stepping in for Trevor today. Trevor's working his day job today. You know, we're blessed to have Larry Snodgrass in our congregation who can just step up last minute. Let's let him know we love him. Can we do that? Well, thank you, Larry, so much. Uh, Jeff shared uh, a little bit about his ordination. I guess you're going to share something about that later. I, can I just say something? I've got the mic. Okay. I wanted that. Now, I... If it goes bad, then I, you said I could say this. No, <laughs> no I, I just want to give a shout out to our pastor. Um, he's worked really hard, really hard. Dedicated man of the Lord. Um, you know, back in, in uh, 1999, uh, I was, Carly and I were at a different church. The church, it was blowing and going. I mean, we baptized 150 plus people a year, and we were running 1,000 on Sunday mornings. And it was crazy. The Holy Spirit was moving in that place. And uh, I remember sitting across from my pastor, a man that I had done ministry with for, for a number of years, uh, discussing the accusations about an inappropriate relationship he was having with another staff member. And uh, I said, please tell me it's not true. And he said, Billy, it's not true. I can't believe they're bringing these accusations against me. Where are my defenders? About two months later, that, uh, that was exposed for what it was. And it devastated our church. It devastated me. And, you know, I, I was at the point where I could not trust a pastor. We had another man come in a couple of years later, good man, loved Jesus, preached the word. I just couldn't trust him. And the person that restored my faith in pastors was Jeff Hatcher. Amen. You know, I just watched Jeff walk. He's not a perfect man, right, Cheryl? Cheryl can testify about that. <laughs> But, you know, I watched him walk with integrity for 12 or 13 years, I, and I said, I can follow a man like that. So, Jeff, God bless you for the man that you're allowing Jesus to make you into. So what I want to do, I want us to stand up, tell our pastor we love him really good. Can we do that? Uh, go ahead and be seated. Enough of that mushy stuff. Let's move on to something else. Well, happy Pentecost Sunday, church. Yeah. Everybody know this is Pentecost Sunday? Yeah. Uh, it was uh, one of the most significant events in Scripture. And, you know, it's kind of hard to say which one was the most significant. You know, Jesus gave himself up on a cross. And, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. There's no forgiveness of sin. Incredibly important event. But if Jesus would have stayed in the grave, Scripture says you and I would still be in our sins. So the resurrection was incredibly important, but we couldn't have the resurrection without the crucifixion. And then if Jesus would have stayed on this earth, well, then nobody would be seated at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for us. So that's where he's at. That's a good thing, right? And he also said, if, if I don't go away, then the helper can't come. And so Jesus goes... The Holy Spirit sort of passed off as a gift to Jesus uh, from the Father, and, and Jesus pours that out on us. And we know this, that particular day, as Pentecost Sunday. I don't know if it's the most significant event in Scripture, but for the church, it was a good day. It was a really good day. And so what I want to do, I want to revisit that, uh, that uh, Scripture, the story out of Acts chapter 2. We're going to read a lot of it today. And uh, I think there's a few takeaways there hopefully we can glean. And uh, I think I need to pray before we do that and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. So pray with me. Father, we love you. And God, you could have given us anything. Jesus, you could have poured out anything on us. You could have poured out finances on us. But what you did, you gave us yourself. You gave us your best. And Holy Spirit, nobody knows more about you than you. So would you reveal yourself to us this morning? Help me to bring honor and glory to the Father. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to set up this scripture if you're not familiar with it. Jesus has ascended into heaven. 
And he tells the disciples to wait, remain, tarry, depending on which translation you have, in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. And he, he was ascended 40 days after the resurrection. Ten days later, Pentecost came, and uh, the disciples didn't know the time frame. They were just told to wait. And so they were waiting in the upper room, and an upper room, I don't know if it was a large building or whatever, second floor, maybe, perhaps, third floor, I'm not sure. But there's about 120 people, and they're waiting. They weren't just waiting, they were praying. It's always good to pray, right, when we're waiting on the Lord. And uh, they were also trying to figure out maybe who Judas's replacement might be. And so there were two men that had walked with the disciples since day one, and that was Matthias and Justice. And so they, they uh, determined that, uh, that one of them needed to replace Judas. And the way they did that is that they casted lots. In our day and time, we may roll dice, and, and whoever has the biggest number wins. We may flip a coin, and we may draw a straw, whatever, to see who actually may uh, be the winner or the loser, whatever the, whatever the little contest is. But uh, God used that act supernaturally. All throughout Scripture, casting lots, it seemed to work. And, uh, you know, my opinion is, my personal opinion is that they got a little bit ahead of the Lord there. Uh, we never hear anything else about Matthias in Scripture. You never hear another word uh, about him. His name's not mentioned anywhere else as far as I know. I believe personally that Paul was God's choice for Judas's replacement. But, you know, they're just trying to figure this out. They're waiting. They're tarrying. Tarrying. And... Uh, then the day of Pentecost comes and everything changes. Everything changes. So we're going to read a lot of chapter 2. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go fast. Try not to get tongue-tied. And we're going to skip a little bit of it. Not that it's not important. But uh, we'll have that on the screen. You ready, Lee? All right, here we go. Buck your seatbelts, church. Here we go. When the day of Pente Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. It wasn't a wind. It was the sound of a wind. Came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I was talking to the Silvestri family who lost their roof in the tornado. And I said, did it really sound like a freight train? They said, yes, it really sounded like a freight train. So there's this violent sound, a violent uh, sound of a violent wind that's coming from heaven. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. It was feast time and it was, it was uh, uh, typical for a lot of visitors to come to Jerusalem during feast time. Maybe up to a quarter of a million people perhaps, whoever you read. So, so a lot of visitors. Uh, verse 6, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in, their own t in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? I love the King James there. It says, what meaneth this? <laughs> what the heck is going on here, basically? That's my translation, by the way. Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. So Peter stands up, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now, now I don't think Peter was just reading the prophecy of Joel right before this happened. I mean, he might have been, but I, I think maybe he went to synagogue school when he was younger. They studied the, the uh, first five books of the Bible, plus they studied the prophets. But somehow, this scripture just came to where he quoted it verbatim. Come on, Holy Spirit. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. 
And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and great and glorious day of the Lord. That's future, if I understand it right. Verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Can I get an amen on that? Impossible for death. Uh, we're going to skip down to verse 29. It says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently, and, da and David speaks about uh, Jesus in one of the Psalms, a prophetic uh, statement in the Psalms, and, and he addresses that. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was, uh, and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he ha was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing that what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he was received from the Father. We have received from the Father. Hang on. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And something unique happened. It says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were pierced. And said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Revival broke out. You know, I've not, I don't preach often. Uh, I've probably run 3,000 people off. <laughs> I, I don't think I've seen 3,000 people get saved. But I mean, think about this. Jesus, he, he did public ministry for three years. Uh, he, he was a great teacher, an incredible teacher, great communicator. The, the crowds were just in awe of the wisdom and knowledge Jesus had. He, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast demons out of people. And, and all the fruit he has to show for that's 120 people holed up in an upper room waiting for him uh, to deliver the promise. And Peter, God bless Peter, we know his track history, right? Stands up one lousy sermon, <laughs> one stinking sermon and 3,000 people get saved. What was the difference? The Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. So I think there are some takeaways here. And uh, you find your note sheet. If you want to take some notes, you can do that. Uh, takeaway number one. <clears throat> this was in verse one. The believers were praying. And you can look through scripture. You can look through uh, uh, history in, in regard to revivals that have taken place and seem like all of them are preceded by the prayers of the saints. People are pressing in. Jesus didn't really say, he might have said this, but it's not recorded in scripture. He didn't say, stay in Jerusalem and pray until you're clothed with power from on high. But obviously they, they knew that, uh, that they need to be praying. You know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we quote this all the time. If my people, God says, will, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will move. It's almost like God is waiting on us to pray, to press in. And, and so he just wants to move. He wants to bless. He wants to pour his spirit out. So the believers were praying. The second thing, second takeaway, is that the believers, the 120, were changed. They were radically different. They weren't the same. Uh, you know, the, the gift of tongues was given to them, and, and uh, they were speaking in language, languages that were known. And this isn't a sermon on tongues. I believe it's a very valid expression of, 
of a gift of gifting of the Holy Spirit. I know some people that have that gift and I trust them fully. There's been also some abuse there, but they were radically different speaking in languages they didn't even know. And, and you know, they were, be, they were accused of being drunk. Now, I haven't been drunk in a long time. <laughs> a, a long time, 1981. 1981, boy, I'll tell you what, when, when, when Jesus got a hold of me, a lot of things changed. And so, um, but, but I was a good drunk, I really was. Prior to that, I was, I was, really, I was really good at it. And I, and I hung around a lot of people that were good at it. And then when I got saved, I, I quit drinking. And, and, you know, and, I, and I don't drink today. And the reason is because when I do something, I'm all in. I mean, I can't stop at one or two beers. I mean, I'm, here I go. And so I, I, just, I need to stay away from it. And uh, that, that's just my conviction because of the struggle that I had in the past. But after I got saved, I was still hanging around some of those people. And they were drunk and I was sober. And, I'm, and I was thinking, did I look that silly? When, when I was drunk, you know, just, just laughing at some stuff that's not even funny. And I, and I determined that only a drunk can understand a drunk. This, the same thing, it, it seems, appears to be funny, but, but these people were accused of being intoxicated. And, you know, I, I never heard an intoxicated person speak in French. Never heard them speak in a foreign language. What, what, what really got my attention, and as I thought, I thought through this, is maybe their behavior. Full of joy, full of laughter, silly as a goose. I, I don't know if there was falling down going on. This isn't a sermon about it. It's okay to fall down in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not that, but there was something going on with these people. They were radically changed. They were radically different because the Holy Spirit had come. And not only were they different, but... The 3,000 people that gave their heart to Jesus, we didn't, we didn't go, go and read the latter part of that chapter, but, but they were different. They gave their heart to Jesus. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden they had compassion for people. They saw people in need, and they would sell property, and, and people they may have, have known for a while that they had no compassion towards. Now they, they knew that they needed something, so they would go sell their property, and then they would lay the proceeds at the disciples' feet, the apostles' feet, and they would distribute those as need be. They trusted the apostles with their possessions. Now, I'm just going to make a statement here, and you may disagree with me. I believe it's impossible to receive the Holy Spirit and not be different. I believe it's impossible because your convictions have to change. Your, your, your language has to change. Your, your, uh, uh, somebody's level of arrogance needs to diminish. Pride needs to diminish. And, you know, if, if somebody has, has walked an aisle, uh, made a profession of faith, recited the sinner's prayer, whatever, if they've done that and nothing's changed, I would be concerned if I was that person about their salvation experience because it's impossible to be the same when the Holy Spirit comes. Something else, another takeaway is uh, uh, as Peter preaches, there's conviction on the crowd. Incredible conviction. You know, they're just saying, you know, what, what do we do? Tell us what to do. You know, Jesus had, had uh, shared a number of times that he was the Messiah and they rejected him and they, and they, and they had him murdered but the people just could not uh, wait to, to receive the answer as to what they would need to do. There was strong, strong conviction of the people. The Holy Spirit was moving on the crowd. You know, I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, if you've experienced that or not. I believe we can't get saved without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. That's just my opinion. You know, I remember in 1981 when I gave my heart to Jesus, boy, the Holy Spirit was working me over one Sunday morning incredibly strong conviction. Had a young man named Charlie Carroll that was preaching that morning, preaching a revival at our church. And uh, it's a sermon that I'd heard, I don't know how many times. But boy, there was something just, just different about that morning. Holy Spirit was just, just working me over. And so it came time for the invitation. It was a Baptist church and you can't get saved in a Baptist church unless you walk down the aisle. I didn't know if you guys knew that or not. You know, it's effective, it works. And so uh, I, I walked down the aisle, and I, boy, I just remember just being exposed for who I was. 
You know, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Convict us that we're sinners. He'll convict us about maybe our lack of righteousness, our unrighteousness, and he will convict us about judgment. And I was convicted about all three of those things. And, and I, I don't think I, I, I verbally said this, or I, I might have thought it. It's, you know, I, I just remember falling down at that altar, and, and I, just, I just knew I was a mess. I knew I was a sinner, and if something didn't change, then I was in trouble. And, and I don't think I said this, but it's almost like, oh, God, don't kill me. Because I knew I deserved his wrath, but what he did, he poured out grace and mercy and love on me that morning. I don't think we can get saved without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to look different for other people. In 1993, Carlene, uh, sweet little Carlene, got saved in 1993. She walked an aisle when she was 13 years old. And uh, a number of years went by. That was the early 70s. I just gave her, her uh, age away. I'm sorry about that. I'll apologize to her later if you want to do the math. But we were sitting in church on a Sunday morning, and, and, and man, she was stirred. She was, just, she was a mess, and so she grabbed me and, and, and uh, said, we need to go pray. So I go to the front, and she said, Billy, I'm not saved. I'm thinking, really? She says, I'm not. And, and the Holy Spirit was convicting her, and he gave, uh, she gave her heart to Jesus that Sunday morning right there at the altar. You know, she was always sweet, but she was, she was so stinking sweet after that, I just couldn't hardly stand her. But she was convicted of her sin. And I don't think we can get saved without that. You know, our, our, uh, our precious daughter gave her heart to Jesus at, at uh, age eight. And for her, it was different. We were starting church one Sunday morning. It was kind of funny because we, had, we hadn't even sang a song yet. She turns to me and says, Daddy, I need to give my heart to, to Jesus Christ. I need to make him a Lord and Savior. And I thought, honey, it's not time yet. You know, <laughs> it's not time yet. You know, the invitation has not been given, but she was radically changed. She was different. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit changes us. Another takeaway was the church that was born that day. You, I mean, think about this. All of a sudden, you go from 120 people to 3,120 people. I mean, how do you manage that? The first mega church. And they didn't know what to do. You know, they didn't have any church growth experts come in and say, now, here's what you do. You, know, you need to establish your leadership to look like this. They, they just trusted the Holy Spirit for what they did. And, and the apostles were absolutely wearing themselves out. At some point, they decided, look, you guys need to focus on prayer and teaching of the word. Let's set up some kind of structure where people's needs will be ministered to. People's needs will be met. The church was a Holy Spirit-led church. Everything they did, they had to depend on him. And I, and I, love, I, I love this church. I love the church. But, but I wonder how far we've gravitated from trusting the Holy Spirit to trusting what man's idea may be about what the church should look like. The church was born that day. You know, I don't believe we can't get saved without the Holy Spirit and we can't stay saved without Him. You know, like I said, I got saved in 1981 and um, it was radical for me. I, 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 was, I was different. Um, I, I wasn't... I wasn't a very good man prior to that. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, Carlene and I dated five years, and this, we were two years into our marriage, and I don't know why she put up with me. I, I, boy, I treated her terrible, treated her horrible. But things changed when I got saved. And so the latter part of the 80s, 1989, I, I mean, I, I'm, I've, I've known the Lord for eight years, and I found myself, uh, for whatever reason, incredibly discouraged, incredibly depressed, and, and, and I was suicidal. You know, I had, a, I had a great job. I was a firefighter for the city of Abilene, and I had, you know, a wife that loved me. I had, a, had two, two children, a boy and a, and a girl, and, you know, 2.2 dogs, you know, kind of like the all-American all -American family. And, and uh, you know, I, I was miserable, and I remember asking the Lord, God, is this as good as it gets? Is this what I have to look to 
forward to for the rest of my life. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do but just to cry out to him. And uh, the Holy Spirit was an, an unknown person to me. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time in Scripture talking in our church about the Holy Spirit. No Sunday school classes, no teaching on it, no preaching on it. But, but I just felt led, didn't know at the time, by the Holy Spirit to start reading the book of Acts. And I was a little afraid to go there because I was afraid of the Holy Spirit. I really was. King James called him a ghost, and I didn't want anything to do with no ghost. There was this mysterious thing that just kind of kind of hung in the air when it comes to the Holy Spirit. But uh, he led me to read the book of Acts, start reading the book of Acts. And that was easy to find because I could take my Bible and I could hold it up like this in and, and the place where the cobwebs were was the book of Acts. It was really easy to find, and I just started reading. Terrified, to be honest. And I got to the 13th chapter, verse 52, and Scripture says that the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. And when I read that, joy was what I needed. I knew that I needed that. And something just leapt up inside of me, but it looked like it was a package deal. You can't have joy without the Holy Spirit. So I said, God, I don't understand this, but fill me with joy in the Holy Spirit. Fill me with joy in the Holy Spirit. And I did that for several months. And uh, one summer day, uh, I, was, I was cleaning swimming pools on, on my part-time part job. And I was driving on South 20th Street, and I was driving west, and I crossed over Barrow, and then if you know that area, and I crossed over Willis. And then I, I drove over Catclaw Creek, and I, I tell people, and I've shared this before, that I didn't have a Jordan River experience, I had a Catclaw Creek experience. <laughs> I don't think there's any significance to that location. But, you know, I drove over that, uh, that creek, and I was overwhelmed by the presence of God. You know, so much so that I had to pull over on the side of the road, and I just began to weep, and, and joy flooded my soul. The Holy Spirit had come. Now, I believe I had him, all of him, at, at salvation. I believe that. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit without measure, Scripture says. But there was, this, I, don't, I don't want to try to put a, a label on what happened, but it was good, and I, and I needed it. And so I remember being on the side of the road, and... and uh, just weeping uncontrollably, and, and, and then I just, I'd never done this before, but I, I, I just I felt like I needed to praise the Lord, and I just felt like I needed to raise my hands. Well, I was in my little Toyota pickup truck with no air conditioner, so the windows were down. And so I, I remember I, I was praising God, and I stuck my hand out the window like this, and then the other one, one, I couldn't lift it up, so I was like this, and I was just standing there, I was sitting there on the side of the road praising God. And people were driving by looking at me and just kind of like, <laughs> what's, what's this guy doing on the side of the road? In church, I can tell you, I've never been the same since that day. We need the Holy Spirit. More than we know, we need the Holy Spirit. You know, God could have given us any gift. Or he could have, the process was he gave it to Jesus and Jesus poured it out. And he could have given us anything. He could have given us a billion dollars apiece. You just name it, perfect health from, from, from uh, the date of our uh, birth to the date of our death. He could have given us perfect health. That wasn't planned. <laughs> Sorry about that. He could have given us all that stuff, but, but he gave us his best. He gave us exactly what we needed. And, you know, sometimes I, I wonder how much God trusts us. How much does he trust his people? He trusts us enough to give us the Holy Spirit. Even though we're going to mess it up, even though we're going to grieve him, even though maybe we're going to embarrass the name of Jesus, it didn't seem to matter to him. He, it's almost like I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit even though they're going to struggle. He 
You know, it's, it's not that he gave him to us on loan. It's not that he gave him to us for a trial run. He's given them to us until Jesus takes him home. I'm sorry about the phone, guys. That kind of got me distracted. Let's go ahead and have the praise team come up. You know, I don't know if you're here this morning. I don't know if you've ever experienced the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever received the Holy Spirit or not, but today is a good day to do that. And if you want to get that right, you can visit with Jeff or myself after the service. And we'd love, love to lead you that direction. You know, I'm here to testify that I need more of him in my life. I've got him. I just need to yield more to him. I, I need him. I can't get by without him. And I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. This, this, I don't want you to experience any peer pressure. And, and, and you, you may not uh, need more of him in your life or, or him to be more active in your life. And that's okay. But if you're here this morning and you say, look, I, I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to yield to him more. I'm just, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us. And I'd like for you to signify doing that by standing. If you feel like, you know, Holy Spirit, I just, I just need to yield to you more. I need to trust you more. I, I, I need to fully realize what you want me to do, what you want me to be about. And no peer pressure to respond. Would you go ahead and close your eyes? <coughs> ask him. Just ask him. He will not withhold from those who ask. I think we need to ask for ourselves. Keep on asking. He's the rewarder of those who earnestly, diligently seek him. Oh God, you're so good to us. The gift that you've given us, the gift that we misuse, the gift we abuse, the gift that we don't hold precious. You knew that and you gave him to us anyway. Help us grow in that area. Help us to trust our best friend more. Help us to yield to him. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who doesn't know you, I pray when they walk out of this building, they'll know you. Holy Spirit, you're so good to bring us into the kingdom. So move right now for the Father's glory. touch us, stir us. And we love you for who you are. Love you, God, for the gift. Love you, Jesus, for the gift. Holy Spirit, forgive us for grieving you. Forgive us of ignoring you.
forgive us of trusting our own wisdom more than trusting your wisdom. Oh God, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Thank you for this time. Have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Hatcher with Wiley United Methodist Church in Abilene, Texas. I want to thank you for listening to this message from God's Word today. Uh, I want to remind you that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus, and He loves you. I also would like to, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to, to pray this simple prayer with me. Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I confess it. I repent of my sin, and I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to wash me as white as snow. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer maybe for the first time today, I want to invite you to do four things. First of all, to share that decision you've made with a member of the clergy. Don't try to walk this journey alone. And then secondly, I invite you to be baptized. Jesus himself commanded us that we should celebrate our faith through baptism. And then I invite you to get into God's word. A book of John is a great place to start. And not because uh, somehow reading the Bible makes us a good person, but because there's life in God's Word. It's His inspired, holy Word. And then finally, I I invite you to find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church to be a part of. If, If you have any questions at all, I just want you to know that I'm available. You can contact me at my email, jhatcher at wileymethodist.org. God bless you.